In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall never overcome it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our next scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. Mary, while still pregnant with the Christ child, visits her kinswoman Elizabeth, who is also pregnant with the child who will become John the Baptist. The child in, uh, that Elizabeth carries leaps in her womb and she cries out, the mother of my Lord. Mary responds with her own words of praise, her own song of joy. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. Amen. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Thanks be to God for these words of life. We pick up the story where we left off in Luke, beginning with chapter 2, verse 8, up through verse 18. The author writes, In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace and goodwill to all. When the angels had left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what has been told them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. This ends the readings from the book of Luke. 
In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler, who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them at the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, and having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Since 1974, the British poet U.A. Fanthorpe has been including a poem in her Christmas cards to friends and family each year. She is an overachiever. But they've recently all been collected and published, and the Telegraph in London ran three of them today. The third has been published elsewhere. It's been a favorite, like outside of the Christmas cards, and it's been a favorite of mine for years. Its last line is where the title of this sermon comes from. But the second one that The Telegraph published was new to me, and I love it, though I'll alter a word when I read it to you in a minute. Though the word was unfamiliar to me, I had to Google it. Uh, and the distinction between the writer and the poem's narrator is pretty clear. The word implies a racism I'm not even willing to hint at in the pulpit. So, the poem calls to mind the fairies at the birth of Princess Aurora. Sleeping Beauty, you remember? Sleeping Beauty. The wicked, slighted fairy, you'll recall, curses the princess. Before the sun sets on her 16th birthday, she will prick her finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel. So, this poem is called The Wicked Fairy at the Manger. My gift for the child. No wife, kids, home. No money sense, unemployable. Friends, yes, but the wrong sort. The work shy, women, undesirables, petty infringers of the law, persons with notifiable diseases, poll tax collectors, tarts, the bottom rung. His end? I think we'll make it public, prolonged, painful. Right, said the baby. That was roughly what we had in mind. I have been crabby about the holiday. I often am until I get into worship on Christmas Eve. 
It's the observances that make this day for me. It is definitely not Christmas Eve parking lots. And this wicked fairy's dire predictions fit my mood. I still have unwrapped presents in my office. I yelled at my kids a lot today. But it's not just that. It's the truth here in this poem. The wicked fairy thinks she's cursing the baby in the manger, but no. Right, he replies. That was roughly what we had in mind. Yesterday was the triumphant staging of our production of the best Christmas pageant ever. I'd been lobbying Stephen for months to let me do it. It's been a favorite since I was a kid when we performed it at my home church. I was the narrator. I was not as good as Maddie Schroeder, who was here. I love the story because it is funny, but also because it is true. The story of the Herdmans, ignorant of the Christian story, uh, the Christmas story from the Bible, are undesirable. The wrong sort to play the holy family. Petty infringers of the law, the bottom rung. The herdmans come and they hear the story that God is with us, that the holy family is overwhelmed, in need, and they become a part of the gospel. In a congregation that had forgotten where and how to look for God, who could say no more about Mary, the singer of the Magnificat, that she was quiet and gentle and kind who knew no better gospel than there are no small parts, only small actors. The herdmans come and embody the miracle of the incarnation. Just before the pageant starts, Beth, the narrator, is fretting to her father. It's just going to be awful, you know. They look like trick or treat, all dirty and fastened together with safety pins and wearing their moldy old sneakers. Mary and Joseph, I mean. They look like refugees or something. And father, wisely, father, played by Mr. C.J. Mitchum in the balcony, well, that's what they were, Mary and Joseph. They were refugees in a way. They were a long way from home, didn't have any place to stay, didn't know anybody. They were probably cold and hungry and tired and messy. The kids and adults of First Church Anytown, USA are dragged, sometimes with the threat of bodily harm, into the Christmas story. The herdmans, fictional though they may be, are just what the baby in the manger had in mind. It's to them, grubby and rough around the edges, to me, impatient and failing to parent as I want to, as I should, God is with us, has come into the world with us. So the other UA Fanthorpe poem from which the sermon title comes is called BCAD, and it begins like this. This was the moment when before turned into after. It amuses me that I so love this poem because this opening line, which again, I think is great, isn't really theologically right according to my way of thinking. As we heard in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. There is no moment in time when God is not in the world, is not with us. When Jesus, the Word of God, is not present and a part of the divine reality. There's not really a before or an after with God. God has always loved the world. God has always been for God's people. That's what we mean when we say the eternal God. God has never been distant. The birth of Christ does not solve a theological problem or close a soteriological a salvation gap. And yet, there are moments Moments when God's presence, when God's promise and power and love are just magnified, are overwhelming in their glory. Theologians like to talk about how there are two different types of time, chronos and kairos. Chronos is chronological, linear time, the minutes, days, months, and years over which our lives unfold. 
Jesus comes to live in Kronos, born into our timeline on Christmas Day all those years ago. But then there's Kairos, the eternal, what was and is and evermore shall be, God's time, which is neither linear nor unfolding in any single way or direction. Kairos is where God abides, the way in which God is. And sometimes, like on that first Christmas night, Kairos comes breaking through the everyday, the ordinary. Sometimes there are angels. Sometimes there are saviors born among us. Sometimes there is good news of great joy proclaimed to all people. We celebrate that night because it is so extraordinary that the mundane of mundanity of life in ancient backwater towns of Israel should be full of divine importance. It's rare that Kairos and Kronos intersect and overlap so fully. But it's not the only time. No pun intended. Thank you. It's late. We were at dinner earlier tonight after the four o'clock service and things were pretty rough while we waited for our food. Energy and spirits were lagging. There were tears. Hattie, the three-year-old, has a gross cold and everyone's been alternately teary and sort of manic all day. There are reasons I was yelling a lot earlier. Not good reasons, but you know, like reasons. Then the food came and it was a whole new ball game. We talked and the girls colored and ate and shared from their plates and talked excitedly about Christmas PJs. And sometimes they snuck a look at the Santa tracker on a phone or watched a commercial on ESPN. There are big screens in the restaurant. At one point an ad for UNICEF or something came on sharing the statistic that 500 children in sub-Saharan Africa alone die from a lack of access to safe drinking water every day. Every day. And two of my kids just kept eating. And Fiona though, my 11 year old, said, oh, and I complain about water from the tap. She doesn't like it. Those kids die. 500, they die because they don't have safe water to drink. It was this moment of holy presence, of epiphany, of a revelation, of a divine connection to a reality beyond the mundane givenness of life at the Fullers. An angel speaking to my daughter that the good news is for all people. And the discrepancy between her experience and that of other kids in Africa or in Flint or in Puerto Rico or on the border is a problem. A problem for God, a problem for the world in which we all live together. A problem and a call for her. We tell a story in church at Christmas about God here for us with us, about God born in this world to be good news for all people, to raise up the brokenhearted, to bring living water, to welcome the stranger. This God child reminds us that God is in all of our lives. This God child was endangered from the start, and not from the fairy in the poem. From, as Mike put it at eight, a ruler so insecure in his own authority that he was willing to attempt to kill a child for the chance that it might shore up his power. Feels almost like a little on the nose, right? But it's right there in Matthew. This is an ancient story. And yet it's a living story too, one that is true over and over again throughout the ages, in your life and in the lives of folks around the world. There was before and after, before and after that night in Bethlehem at the manger when Quirinius was governor of Syria, but there's also the way that God is eternally, always, then and now and forever, in persecuted kids and refugee parents, and in the work shy, women, undesirables, the petty infringers of the law, the persons with notifiable diseases, the poll tax collectors, the tarts, the bottom rung. And in my kid at Fuller's, and in all of us here, slightly tired but bright-eyed and joy-filled, hearts open 
voices raised. God is born among us. The great American novelist E.L. Doctorow once wrote that writing a novel is like driving a car at night. You can see only as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. He writes really long novels that way too. None of us are writing novels here tonight, I assume, at least not at the moment, but I think Doctorow's write about more than the art of fiction. We hear this old story and we're asked, tasked by the living God born among us to make it our story, to live it, to share good news of great joy for all people, that story that life, that light is not overcome, that peace will reign. This good news, this promise is so bright and beautiful to imagine and often perhaps because its beauty is so big and so bright, it blinds us. Our pupils close up and we can't see it anymore. Can't see which path to follow. Perhaps we would do better to allow the story to seep into our lives as by the light of the candles which we share in a moment. In the moments of quiet with only voices raised in song to speak this story into being, to connect us to the people of God here and now and everywhere and forevermore. This is U.A. Fanthorpe's poem, B.C. A.D. This was the moment when before turned into after and the future's uninvented timekeepers presented arms. This was the moment when nothing happened. Only dull peace sprawled boringly over the earth. This was the moment when even energetic Romans could find nothing better to do than counting heads in remote provinces. And this was the moment when a few farm workers and three members of an obscure Persian sect walked haphazard by starlight straight into the kingdom of heaven. Perhaps in these moments, we it too can begin to make our way, haphazard by starlight, straight into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. <laughs>